Pam, I see a few Toronto people uh, in the mix and nice to see some familiar faces as well. Uh, thank you for to Anne and Kevin for that introduction. Really excited uh, to be with you tonight to just share what is really a journey uh, and a journey which, to be honest, we're not sure where the destination ends in sight. So this is just sort of phase one of the work that we're doing. And I'm here really representing a leadership team here at Unis Hanoi that we're deeply committed uh, to the work uh, that I'm about to share. So while I'm speaking on behalf of the team, uh, just really excited to be here with you today. Uh, and yes, Megan and I did uh, co-author an article that shared some of our experiences. So this is really just an opportunity to expand upon some of the work that we shared in that article uh, dating back a couple of months. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, hopefully we uh, have it actually one second here. Um, I was joking with Kevin, we'd been back in person and like my Zoom uh, dexterity has uh, dropped a little bit just with uh, having been back in person. So now let me get back up on here, share that, and then we should be able to go. Uh, so thank you once again. So uh, the title of today's webinar is Dismantling and Rebuilding Equity, a Recruitment and Practices Through an Equity Lens. Uh, Kevin started with an land acknowledgement, uh, and it's interesting, I just shared with him in the, just as we were getting in ready, uh, one of the things I'm working on actually is trying to figure out what a land acknowledgement might look like for an expat uh, living in uh, a host country. So uh, looking to do that specific to our context in Hanoi, and, and, and that's hopefully a resource that we can share out through ALOC uh, once we we're comfortable with where it is in its own drafting stage. But uh, really just sort of, I want to turn back the clock to uh, September 2021. For those of you that might have been aware, Hanoi was probably in the midst of its worst lockdown. Uh, Vietnam and uh, was in what Hanoi was under what was called Directive 16, full lockdown, really hard to leave your house, uh, really hard to just sort of go out and get groceries was the sum total of what we could do. As a leadership team, we were trying to think about where our DEI work lived and what we could do and tackle uh, within the context of a really sort of challenging uh, distance learning experience and a lockdown. And some of the more complex parts of the international education ecosystem are curriculum, teaching and learning and pedagogy and recruitment. We were very leery and mindful of how much we wanted to task our teachers doing beyond what we were able asking them to do with distance learning and the challenges that it presented itself. So we took it upon ourselves as a leadership team to really kind of focus on the recruitment side of things because we felt that was something we had the capacity and more important, the desire and the willingness to get into and really get our hands dirty, look at our systems, look at our structures and figure out a way forward with that work. So step one, so I'm gonna break this down into four steps for you tonight. I think Kevin, you said of about 30 minutes. So I'll try not to rush, but I wanna just make sure we kind of go through the steps. Step one, I'm calling know thyself. Uh, to understand what diversity looks like, you have to figure out what you're measuring it against. Uh, we did a demographic survey at our school, which in and of itself was an incredibly interesting and dare I say, Megan and I have used the word messy process. Uh, our first crack at it, we used some, uh, kind of classifications uh, that actually we realized upon uh, reflection that didn't really speak to our community. So we really have to sort of streamline it, make it more understandable. There were, we actually looked at demographic and statistical surveys from census uh, boards uh, at the United States, at Canada and other areas uh, to look at how they define certain groups. Um, and what we realized in the first iteration that wasn't really meeting our needs, we didn't really surface the data that we wanted. We streamed that down and we actually were then able to actually develop a better understanding of who we are as an organization. Uh, and we actually extended that not only to our faculty, but we looked at our board of directors, our senior leadership team, as well as our faculty and staff. Uh, it was an optional survey, but most, uh, I, I think a, a significant uh, number, I think well upwards of uh, close to 80 to 90% participated in that. And we were able to really sort of capture a snapshot of who we were and who we are as an organization. Uh, concurrently, at the same time, many of us were actually enrolled and engaged in the NISA DEIJ session led by Darnell Fine, Elisa Pereira, and Dr. Jennifer Beckwith. Uh, and that quote really kind of kickstarted us, which is to tell, to let us tell you who we are will be the most useful data to understand who we are as an organization. So our team really leaned on that and helping sort of unpack what our journey would look like. So you can see there from that um, uh, from that image that we, as a leadership team, were about 50-50 split, uh, and that was between male and female. Uh, we actually have members of our community on our teaching staff who are openly uh, gender fluid or non-binary, which was awesome. 
uh, and then the distribution of LGBTQ+, white and BIPOC. And we know that these are just a few of the snapshots and the ways you capture people's identities. So we were acutely aware that we weren't getting everything, but this was at least enough of a starting point for us. So that was part one. Step one, know thyself. Um, step two, living our values, a recruitment statement that we felt needed to be strong and really say who we are as an organization. So what I'd like for you to do is uh, on your screen, take a minute to just read that uh, and, and take a moment to just process that and then uh, I'll move on. So take about a minute or a minute and a half to do that. said take a minute then I realized I didn't put a timer on so I'm assuming it's been about a minute for you to, to, to process that Kevin maybe we can share the slides out or snippets of it later at the end of the session but we we really wanted a statement that we felt showed who we are we want people in our community who are mission aligned uh, we want people really to be part of our community and who are going to live and be part of this value system uh, in the year prior to last year so 2021, we were working on new strategic directions and a new mission, vision, and values. And we really baked in some of those core principles around DEIJ into that work. So this was almost a reflection of that work that we had done in the year prior and to put it out there uh, and really sort of invite candidates uh, to join our community. Uh, and that was actually a very positive, uh, a very positive experience. Um, we actually tweaked our interview process so that every candidate that we interviewed, um, either teaching and non-teaching, was asked to reflect on the statement and explain how it impacts its impacts their work. Uh, so not only did we ask them to read it uh, in the interview process, we actually asked them to tangibly explain how that spoke to them uh, and what they would do to be a champion for that vision and our mission, vision, and values. Um, what really was affirming for us as a leadership team was the number of candidates who uh, spoke to being seen by this statement uh, and many and said that's what drew them in to apply to our school. Uh, so we really opened a wide range of candidates who perhaps might not have uh, felt compelled to apply to UNIS in years past. Uh, and we really were proud that we were able to rain, uh, gather such a really beautiful array of candidates. Um, obviously we can't hire them all, but we really met some incredible people along the way. People who still stay top of mind as I think about, oh, that person was, possibly a good fit for this year based on recruitment needs. So a lot of people made some incredible impacts on our team as well. Step three uh, was in really invaluable PD, professional development led by Dr. Alan Fan. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the work that Alan really led for us as a team. It was transformational both for me individually and for us as an organization. Um, and Alan took our team, and actually I want to even step back one step further. Uh, my connection to Alan actually was with my co-deputy principal in the elementary, Natasha, and I attended an online conference last year led at Seoul Foreign School called Soul of a Leader. Uh, and at Soul of a Leader, Alan shared some of the work. His doctoral work focuses on uh, implicit bias training, uh, implicit bias and recruitment. Uh, Natasha and I were texting uh, after the presentation because, again, we were locked down. That's how we communicated. And we said, we got to get Alan in with our team. What do we need to do? So... And Natasha and I took uh, a pitch to our leadership team, our head of school team, and within about really 27 of making 27 seconds of making the pitch, they're like, "Approved, let's go, let's get Alan on board." So Alan took us through a two-part session. Uh, the first one looking at implicit bias, uh, really kind of the psychological underpinnings of bias, um, and when we had a one week to reflect and process. And then the following week, uh, he had us go through some recruitment bias training. So a little bit more of a nuts and bolts uh, process uh, to the work uh, around recruitment. I found the questions that really we raised as a team were incredibly powerful. Where might we have benefited from bias in our own journey to get to where we were as a leadership team? Where has bias worked against us? Uh, and what are things we overlook when resumes come our way? So things that we talked about were well, we really like seeing people who have worked in similar schools, 
Uh, we like seeing people who have a certain credential or degree from a certain place. Uh, and we really had to sort of strip down and unlearn our, our biases so that we could be more inclusive when we vetted candidates through the screening process. Um, and with that comes actually a significant amount of commitment to the work, and particularly in time. Um, our, our leadership team handles a lot of the screening and the recruitment work. And so what we knew is that we would have to really commit a significant amount of time to this work. But the good news is we were all ready and really keen and eager to jump in. So I do want to sort of uh, acknowledge standing on the shoulders of Alan's work uh, because that really elevated us as an organization and helped us get to where we needed to go. Uh, step four uh, was actually signing up for the Diversity Collective. Uh, Alan's uh, recruitment organization really brought us a wider range of candidates who uh, come from sort of the uh, non-dominant groups, uh, a lot of BIPOC candidates, LGBTQ+, neurodivergent candidates. Uh, we were able to add to our database of um, recruitment, sort of our recruitment databases, uh, Diversity Collective, and again, just opened our eyes to just a beautiful array of candidates that were in their community who were really keen to join our, uh, to join Eunice, to come to Vietnam, uh, and to share their experience with our, with our students. And that was really what we were looking for. How are students going to benefit from all this work? And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, so kind of nuts and bolts here, screening protocols. We spent a lot of time working with HR, with our own secretaries and our teams to really kind of think about training, that's doing some internal training on, uh, on our screening protocols. Uh, and that was a real sort of sort of unlearning and relearning for, uh, for our candidates. Uh, we just simply put, understood that our previous mechanisms were not really effective in generating the type of candidates that we felt we wanted to be part of our community moving forward in the sense of more representation, more diversity. I looked at my calendar this morning as I was preparing this, and I realized that uh, I had 38 first round interviews for nine positions that I was leading last year, which is about 4.2, if you're really getting into the math, uh, 4.2 first rounds per position. Uh, I don't have stats from what that was in years past, but I was doing nine positions and my co-deputy principals and our principal were leading other searches. So what that tells us is that we really, really took the time to interview. So that for me was about over 38 hours of first round interviews, just first round, not even second round interviews. Um, the other thing I felt very compelled to do and I felt very strongly about was offering feedback to candidates if they did not move past our first round. Uh, I have been in, in, in situations in my recruitment journeys where you don't make it past the first round and you're always wondering why. Um, I think for many BIPOC candidates or people who sort of come from non-dominant communities, there's always a sense of what was it. So for every candidate that did not make it past our first round uh, after our recruiting season was over, I invited them to a 20 minute optional feedback session. Uh, and I just sort of walked them through the interview. This is what we really appreciated. This is what I might recommend you look for in terms of specific training or, um, and, and, uh, and really wanted them to understand what we can help them grow even in that 20 minutes to help them be successful in their next uh, recruitment journey. Not everyone uh, did that, but I do feel that sort of really benefited uh, candidates spoke favorably about having the opportunity to learn a little bit more about where they could grow uh, in their own recruitment journey for future years. So we're very happy to take that on. I think it's an important responsibility as leaders uh, to really figure out how we can continue to grow people even within, even when they're not necessarily part of our organization or not moving into an organization. Uh, we also were running one leadership search for a middle school deputy principal. So we had an internal committee and I took them through a very sort of truncated version of Dr. Fan's work that and that committee included middle leaders, faculty, staff and students. Uh, and so really we wanted to bring that recruitment implicit bias training to our screening process for the deputies, uh, for the deputy candidates, as well as then to the committee so that they were all on the same page and mission aligned with us in terms of what we were looking for. So that was a really sort of a nice little internal PD, again, uh, leaning on Dr. Fan's work to help move us forward. So what did we end up with, the results? Uh, you know, we ended up having about a 38% increase in non-educators who identified outside of non-dominant, uh, outside of dominant groups. So that could be LGBTQ+, BIPOC, neurodivergent, or as we know, within the sort of the framework of interse intersectionality, 
one, two, or three of those sort of definitions. So we were very proud of that work. We, we really sort of made some really powerful strides um, to bring into our community candidates that um, really were representing who we wanted to be as an organization and really helped us diversify um, our, our, our community. Uh, and really, I know I'll share anecdotally a story that I think summarizes this. Um, we've Since we've opened school kind of under normal circumstances, we've been able to host a significant number of events uh, include that have invited our community onto the campus. And we had uh, a candidate, uh, sorry, excuse me, we had our someone from our admissions team who was meeting with a parent and another teacher at a welcome barbecue. Uh, and that teacher was uh, someone who was BIPOC and that parent said, you know, I just realized that you're my daughter's teacher. And on the first day she came home and she said, my teacher looks like me. And, and just the power in that story was really, really something that I just sort of sat with that for a bit. Yes, I'm like, oh, that's that's really awesome to see that uh, uh, and, and see our students recognize that and our community recognize that and they celebrate that and they champion that. Um, so there are always gonna be stumbling blocks and, and bumps in the road, but I, I do feel that our community has really responded favorably and positively uh, to seeing such broad representation uh, in our community and we're very proud of that. And we also know, as I said at the beginning, that this is a journey. Uh, this is not that we didn't finish and say, all right, we've solved it, problem's over, let's move on. We actually understood acutely that this is just step one in an ongoing process. Um, and I think back to the NISA uh, work uh, that we were doing at the time, uh, diversity is, uh, and sorry, excuse me, inclusive is making those numbers. Those count. We can sit there and look at the 68% and say, that's amazing, our work here is done, but really what we know is that's just a starting point. Uh, that Dr. Beckwith's comment about don't bring people into a burning house really resonated with our team. Uh, so moving forward, as we think about onboarding, uh, we wanna look at an anti-oppression, anti-racist and anti-bias board onboarding process for our community. Um, how do we ensure that the diverse candidates that we hire feel really welcome, not within us, us as leaders and maybe us as a faculty, but within the whole, broader community as well. And something we've really struggled with, uh, and I think is a really point of emphasis, uh, important point of emphasis for us moving forward is really strengthening representation and elevating the voices of our Vietnamese colleagues. Uh, to be a truly equitable organization is to look at everyone that is in our community and, and thinking about where do we give voice to our Vietnamese colleagues? Uh, where do we give them leadership opportunities? Uh, where do we really kind of recruit Vietnamese um, teachers who are keen and able and willing to join our, our, our community. Um, one of the things that we were sort of disheartened by a little bit was that despite having such incredible sort of representation through the recruitment process and getting really uh, some wonderful diverse candidates, we did not have a lot of Vietnamese candidates apply for our positions. Um, and so now we want to think about why that was uh, the case. What do we need to do to move that forward? What are the partners? partnerships we need to forge, whether it's with teacher training centers, with the Ministry of Education here in Hanoi and in Vietnam, what are those steps that we need to take intentionally to kind of ensure that when we talk about a school that has 20% Vietnamese, we want our students to be uh, represented there and not just see, uh, you know, um, not just see sort of other um, members of other or, um, groups or, or, or racialized groups, but see themselves within the teachers outside of the sort of the areas of sort of maybe language um, and, and really see them as a, as representation uh, within the ranks there. So that's the next step. Uh, it's something that we're really gonna be thinking about as we move into recruitment season uh, for the next year. And I, I think Kevin, I, I think I'm getting close. I know you wanted to do a little Q and A. So I've just put my email address up on the screen. Uh, if you wanna take a picture of that, feel free to email me. Um, you know, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I, I really am, am by no means an expert. Uh, we're, we're a school and a leadership team that's on a journey. I'm happy to speak on behalf of that group, um, but I'm happy to also connect you with uh, inspired people like Dr. Fan who helped lead us uh, in, into where we wanted to go and where we feel like we needed to be, um, as well as some of the other organizations and individuals that have really sort of helped us steward this work uh, within our school. So. Uh, thank you. I think I'm coming up around 8.26. I think, Kevin, you said maybe a few minutes for Q&A, so I'll stop sharing my screen just so I can uh, see everybody. And um, yeah, over to you.
Awesome. Thank you so much. We want to give him some virtual love for sharing their stories and being real. I want to give a verbal shout out to Constance Collins. She's on this call. Oops, she's like, what? Last year, Constance messaged us about um, just recruitment. And the one thing that we looked at uh, at ALOC was how do we make sure we amplify the stories of schools, leaders, individuals who are doing things differently, doing things to dismantle, to disrupt um, these practices. And so that's our focus for this year. So we wanna make sure we give a verbal shout out to Constance Collins, Collins who shared, you know, how do we make sure these practices are shared so that others know, and there are no excuses made around recruitment. And so tonight is the one of many. So we plan on doing a, a several. At first we thought, oh, let's do a conference or do something virtual. We're like, no, we want to do a series. So as we find and hear other stories uh, from schools, if you're a school that's on here who's been rethinking uh, or doing some work just behind the scenes, no matter where you're at, even if it's in this, you know, we're in the ideation form, uh, we want to highlight, amplify that work. So thank you so much. But Q&A, let's turn it over. If you have uh, questions, um, and you'll look up, and you want to watch the chat, and then I'll see if anyone raises their verbal hand. So this is your space, your floor. Ask tonight questions. Good to see everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Don't be shy. There was actually, Kevin, a question in the uh, chat about uh, visas and some of the legalese around bringing candidates in. And I thought I'd maybe address that. Uh, it's a good question. I believe it came from Ali. I hope you're still on the call. Um, we, uh, to be honest, we didn't actually encounter that. We have some candidates who joined us who are not, uh, uh, English is not their first language. Um, and for us, what we, what we sort of through the HR process, really, it just boils down to having the relevant visas for uh, for the job. Now, with the caveat, as always, is that as Vietnam is sort of evaluating its own policies and process, we always have to beta test our policies and process against that. What we don't want to do is say to a candidate, come join us, and then find out that we are unable to secure them a visa. So part of our initial, when you get to that second and third round stage, is really making sure that HR has some sort of uh, oversight in terms of what we need to do to ensure that we can bring them in. It's not to see, it's not to say, oh, we have to eliminate that candidate, but it's where do we need to work within our existing frameworks to make sure that we can invite them in. So Ali, I hope that answers the question um, uh, to some extent, um, but if you wanna ask further that, um, you know, that'd be great. So uh, yeah. Uh, questions about the survey have come up. Uh, it was 100% optional. Sandy, I think you put that question out there and I think I got a, a private message about that as well. 100% optional, but I think a lot of people were keen to, to respond. I think we've laid down the groundwork about our DEI work and in our inclusion work in the year prior. So uh, I wouldn't say our teaching community was surprised we were gonna do something like that. A few people did raise their eyebrows, understandably. Uh, some responded with very interesting comments on the Google form. Always interesting to see people's reflections and their and their responses to that. Um, but we had pretty significant uptake, enough for us to feel comfortable about publishing those numbers in light of where we're at. I know other countries might be bound by human resources or labor rights um, limitations in that, uh, and we and we kept it 100% optional. Um, the one question that we did actually act in take out in our initial phase was a question around uh, neurodivergence, uh, because we were a little bit uncertain about whether people would be comfortable self-reporting that, uh, depending on their sort of the, the definition of neurodivergent, whether it was related to mental health and well-being. So we elected to keep that out, and I'm, I think that was the right call. Uh, because when we do, so going back to the visa, when we do have to secure a visa to work here, you do have to do a health check. So we didn't want to put anyone in an uncomfortable situation. So we we kept it maybe about, you know, maybe not quite 
uh, right, not at the ground level, but maybe 10,000 feet up in terms of the, the definitions we were looking for, the, the de categories we were looking for. I hope that helps answer that question. Yeah. Right, a few more up in here. I'm going to get uh, yeah. Pinto. I, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I was just seeing the same one. Go ahead. Yeah. Let me get Pinto. You want to hop in here and ask? I think that's a good one. Let's do some of these things. We're, we're pulling these Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank yeah, you. I'm happy to. So that was uh, excellent. Thank you tonight. I just, I have this for you and for everybody else. Um, I think you put the quote in there about the burning house, which is interesting. But I also wonder when you have successful applicants, when you're broadening your approach, what are ways to prepare those applicants for the fact that they're going to encounter perhaps some microaggression, some elements of bias, because you are coming into a general pool of people who maybe were not recruited with a very open approach. And so, you know, I'm just curious how you prepare people. Hi, Giles. Nice to see you. It's a great question. Um, to be honest, Giles, I think one of the things that is part of our, our next level of work is to, is to really kind of build some very sort of prescriptive programming around microaggressions. One thing we do in advance of inviting, in, of sh we share the candidates that are hired when our recruiting season closes, ideally usually around mid-year, and we share their biographies with our community so that people are aware of who is who will be joining us. Um, and I don't want to make it seem like it's a utopian ideal where we're at, but to be, uh, but we haven't heard to this point feedback that might suggest that uh, that there. Are, I'm not saying it's not happening, but. Part of our work is now to, uh, I'm leaning on the work of Duggan and Shafir here, like that street data that we need to start collecting in terms of those stories um, now that we're about uh, a month into school, just to kind of see where they're at. We have a weekly check-in with our newbies, um, a breakfast every Friday, um, and we're talking about potentially maybe using that time to just sort of have some either facilitated conversation or some or, or some or using that maybe for some one on one time to share some of those stories. Um, so I don't know if any newbies are on the call, but um, that that's where we're at. And I know that's an important next step for our work moving forward. I hope that answers it, Giles. Excellent. Here's one. Do you all have any visa limitations for dependents, insurance of same sex couples? If so, how are you handling those applicants? Uh, well, I'm stepping into HR territory that I need to be careful with here, but we do have same sex couples in our community with children at our school. So um, my understanding, and I'll double check this, is that Vietnam recognizes uh, uh, partnership, uh, same sex partnerships. So uh, I, if Kevin, maybe what I can do is I can confirm that with HR, but like, like I said, we do have members in our community who are openly out in domestic partnerships or legal uh, domestic partnerships with children who are in our community. And, and that's again, something that we celebrate. It's interesting. We use Veracross as our uh, student information system. And we're actually having that conversation about how we actually categorize families uh, within the uh, within the mix. So that's something that uh, we, we are actually uh, aware and looking at as well. Uh, actually, someone is clearly listening from my team because it says, yes, Vietnam recognizes partnerships. So uh, thank you uh, to my colleague. <laughs> How about Anne, you want to ask that next one? Yeah, so the next one is have you seen international schools with, within countries or regions banding together to create a pipeline for educators of color to move into leadership admin positions? Is, I, I'm not sure if that's a question for you, Kevin, or for me. Um, uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, certainly we our work here has been largely within ourselves, and that's not to say that we're not in a position to engage with in conversations with other schools that are interested in going down in this journey with us. Um, and uh, I know Kevin, your work through ALOC has been transformational for me as an individual, uh, but certainly for our organization as well in terms of elevating and lifting voices. I was fortunate to have been part of the in, uh, Aspiring Leaders of Color program last year. My colleague is this year as well. So uh, that's been a great pipeline for, for that work uh, as well. So. Yeah. 
and I will say support wise, um, CIS, ISS, um, and School Spot have been the three. We've not, just because this is year two, we've not really reached out to regional associations, um, but that's one thing that we're looking at, as well as schools housing their own similar type of program for aspiring leaders within their building. All right, the next question is, do you engage your parent community in the process? How have they responded to a more diverse teaching community? Um, we do not engage them in the recruitment process, partly just uh, out of time and efficiency, but, um, and I don't know many schools that would, maybe for a significant role, a leadership position, we would have, and that's where you included students. I believe when we recruited for a middle school deputy, we might have had a parent, but I'll double check if that, I'll have to look back on that. Uh, so um, the question about onboarding our community, similar to uh, what we do with our faculty and staff, uh, uh, not maybe in January, but once recruiting has closed, our head of school and her weekly community update shares the biographies of the candidates that have, that will be coming into our school. Um, and, and I don't want to sound like a broken record. Uh, I, I think we have an incredibly so we have a leadership team that will absolutely go to bat for the people we hire. So when and if it comes up with um, when and if it comes up with a parent and, uh, and like I said, I, I, it may or may not have uh, this year. I'm not I'm, I can't say for certain. But what I do know is that we talk about it as a value. We one of our values as a school is diversity. Uh, one of our values as a school is personal and academic excellence. One of our values is integrity. Uh, and when you frame it against those values, it becomes very much a conversation about mission alignment. Uh, and that's a phrase we use with our students uh, when we talk about restorative justice practices. How have you acted in accordance with our values as a school? And that sort of is a great through line to carry us all the way forward as well when we have those conversations with families or for faculty that might be resistant to change, which has been quite fast and powerful and poignant for our community. You know, when you talk about a 38% increase one year to the next, uh, that, that's, that's pretty significant change in a short amount of time. And I think we've been very open about this is what we want to do. These are our goals. And I think that's invited people to have that conversation if they're not comfortable with it. But when you fall back on those values, it's a, we're a UN school. And I think that's a good, that's a good starting point for us. When we talk about the Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms and representation, um, and yeah. All right, next question. Do you have any suggestions for when members of leadership rely on the trope that diverse candidates just don't apply here? Uh, broaden your pool. Uh, diversity collective is it, or collab. I always get it confused. It's collaborative collective. For some reason, I can't get it right. Uh, broaden your pool. Um, I think that's it's a trope. Um, I think when you look at where you're posting your positions, if it's just on your website, uh, that might be a problem. If it's not being done locally, that might be a problem. What are the partnerships you have within your local community to get the word out about positions at your school? Um, I would argue that having more awareness of, uh, of organizations like the Diversity Collective really kind of put us in a position to draw on from there. I, I would love for us to be in a position moving forward down the road, uh, you know, in my utopian, if I rule the world sort of vision that for every position we had a minimum of someone, you know, two to three people from a non-dominant group be part of the initial pool. Um, and, and if we can't find, if they're not there in the initial, then we go find them. Uh, and I, and I realize that's, that's extensive work. That's, that's probably phase two or three. Um, but just even really rethinking what are the databases we use, um, has actually, you know, through just even partnering with one organization brought in that pool for us. Okay. And the next question, um, you've answered a little bit of this, but I'm going to read it. It's onboarding. Did you have to deal with resistant parents? And if yes, how did you deal with uh, some of the pain points for parents, for example, accents? Um, so, and it's, it's a really, it's an interesting question. I, I personally, and to this point, we're about, about five weeks into the school year. We haven't had to deal with it. In fact, we've had interestingly 
kind of the opposite experience where at parent nights, we've actually had parents from BIPOC communities come to us and say, oh, it's so great to see uh, you know, uh, representation from at, at the leadership team level. Like our, our team of four in the secondary has two BIPOC and two LGBTQ plus uh, rep representation from those sort of, uh, from those identities. Uh, um, and so I, 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 like I said, I don't want to, I don't, I do not want to misrepresent and say it's a utopian ideal, but to this point, we, we have not, I have not had to uh, take on that challenge, um, but it comes back to uh, falling back on our values. Um, and, uh, and I know it's happened in the past. Uh, and I think, and then that's uh, when, when their, when their colleagues uh, of mine in, in other departments or even within our division have had to deal with it falling back on your values, being really true to yourself as an organization about why you want it to. You don't want anyone to feel like they're not being valued once they're in there. And that means then you have to go to bat and really advocate for why any person should be part of your community, whether Vietnamese, whether they're BIPOC or anything, uh, or any other part of the uh, uh, identity representation that we talk about. Thanks to Nye. And here's the last one. We'll see if there's any others. What are you doing? I know you talked about um, the weekly um, meetings and check-ins with your new teachers, but what are you doing at UNIS to support a continued sense of belonging in order to support retainment? How do you grow a sense of safety and trust in your community? Oh, that's a that's a great question. That is part of our evolution. Uh, you know, th there's uh, there's no concrete answer beyond really. I think those check-ins are a starting point. Uh, I think a willingness as an organization to be open and honest to the feedback and criticism that we might rightfully receive. Um, you know, it's, it's always stings to hear when you think you're doing something right and realize actually, no, people aren't feeling this way or that's not having the intended consequence or that's not having the intended outcome. It's actually having an adverse consequence on our community. Um, we've talked a lot about what it means to be an organization like ours, where I think there's a perception of having to be 100%, 100% of the time. And have we for sort of fallen into that myth amongst ourselves? So how do we actually ensure that our candidates are taking care, or excuse me, our, our new colleagues are taking care of themselves, uh, that they're that we're talking about well-being and balance and actually then trying to live that value as leadership and, and empowering people to take the time that they need. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't, there's no firm answer to that other than it's something that we want to keep doing uh, and hopefully we'll grow into be more part, more formally part of our systems and structures moving forward. All right, I'm gonna read this sort of testimonial. It says, and thanks um, Sandy, I saw some of that feedback too about um, parents and I would definitely check out the chat you all. Um, Naren and Gary here, they're newbies to Eunice. They're loving it here. Appreciate the intentionality that went to recruitment. As BIPOC members, it feels very right. Nothing is perfect because of the current we all live in, but we're supported all, at all layers within Eunice, and that's felt empowering. Seeing representation in our admin has also felt revolutionary. Uh, Sandy asked, when communicating within your own staff, how do you report on the success of recruiting a wider pool of candidates? Do you have targets? Do you report on candidates or appointees? Um, I, we've we've actually talked about that target question, Sandy, and I think there's some interesting discourse within if you set a target and you don't miss it, have you failed? Uh, by definition, yes. And then also sometimes those targets are moving and need to be responsive to the to the environment that you're in. Um, I would say that we we have shared more broadly, uh, and again. And through the through the biographies of the candidates we tell, we're a very open team. We talk quite actively about the process. Uh, one thing we do is when we get to a if a candidate moves past a first round uh, interview, so we might have from a pool of let's say five to six candidates, we might invite maybe two to three to move into. We widen the we widen the interview panel to include other members of staff. So that could be a department head or it could be a teacher a teacher specialist. So our hope is just even by osmosis and having more people involved with the process in the second and third round or maybe fourth round stages that we are um, that we're able to sort of share the work that we're doing. Um, you know, through being invited to write at TIE and having our school champion that work. Um, is another way to share that this is something that we're really passionate about. It's something we believe in. Um, and, and I think that conversation about targets will be interesting when we get into recruitment season this year, right? Like, I don't know uh, if that's something we want to be more intentional about. I think last year was our first year really trying to take this on. And I think 
Um, I, I, I would, on, if I'm being totally honest, and I have been the whole time, I think we far exceeded what we were hoping. Like we were kind of floored uh, with the with the diversity of candidates that we were able to have to uh, invite and to apply, and who we were able to hire. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll revisit that conversation when recruiting kicks off uh, in, I guess, I guess any minute now if we're really thinking about it, so. Any other questions? I have a few minutes here. You can come off and ask or you can type them in the chat. We'll look for them. I do have a quick comment, Kevin. How are we doing this morning? Good, Ryan. Nice to see you. Thanks for the session. Very informative. Absolutely groundbreaking work. Unfortunately, I'm seeing that in 2022. Um, I think there's a huge part of the conversation missing, and, and just uh, maybe we can get this going in, an, in a future session, but I think we need to talk about the recruiters um, because they have a massive role to play in this. I mean, this is absolutely fantastic and groundbreaking that we're speaking about one specific school, uh, but it's the recruiting agencies like Search, ISS, uh, RG175, and Carney Sandow that are the true pipeline for all the teachers, especially when it comes to leadership positions and those of us in the ALOC community looking to uh, either move laterally in leadership or move up into leadership. They really hold a lot of the keys to those doors, unfortunately. Um, and so getting them to the table to talk about all the bias and systemic racism that uh, and so systemic marginalization that exists within those organizations is absolutely key for us making uh, breaking that glass ceiling and making it up into leadership positions. Um, I can tell you because I've gone through several processes and Kevin and I have spoken about this uh, at length and over the last 18 months or so. And you see time and time again that leadership positions end up going to people who are from the dominant class, specifically white males. Um, and those doors aren't being opened up for people in ALOC and, other, and the BIPOC community move up into leadership positions. A huge problem is that uh, many of those uh, consultants are from the dominant class and don't represent us. And so when we go and we sit in front of them, they have no idea about the, um, the, the huge amount of assets that we bring to the table that might not be what they're specifically looking for. Um, and so I think this is a huge part of the conversation we need to, to bring forward into the future. Thank you, Ryan. Task Force October, trust me, it's on the list. And when I say on right, the I've been a big fan of your work for a long time online, and I really appreciate that comment. I think it's, uh, I think it is true. I think, um, uh, I think at a certain point, you know, when we talk about us as an organ, we can we control our own destiny with this work to some extent. Uh, but when you put it to outside forces that might not actually share that same value system system or haven't been through the requisite training. Um, uh, yeah, that's where you see the stagnation occur. Uh, that's where you see uh, further marginalization. Uh, I've seen it. I, I worked in Canada for 11 or 12 years before coming abroad, and uh, I definitely saw it there. And, um, and, and there were, you know, every time you saw someone who looked like you ascend to a leadership position, you just certainly immense amount of pride, but it was also kind of noticeable, like about how isolating yeah. that can feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's I'm going to add that... one quick, one more quick comment, Kevin. I don't, you know, I don't like to dominate space too much, but there's 10 minutes left. So I know someone else can jump in when I'm done. Um, tonight, I, I also worked in Canada for eight years and I'm actually thinking about repatriating because we have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We have the Ontario Human Rights Code. We have school board equity policy, which ensures that this work is, is getting done and brothers and sisters are going to move up. Um, I do want to share one quick anecdote because there might still be people in the audience that think, oh, this might be a situation where Ryan is facing certain barriers to himself, but this does occur uh, with people from the dominant class who are working for these search firms. And I was in a head of school interview with one of these firms with a consultant for a school in Ethiopia. And I shared this story with Kevin recently because I was so flabbergasted, I didn't know what to do. And we were talking about uh, the living conditions, you know, as they do in these first round interviews about the country you're going to and have you done your research? And of course I have, I'm applying for the position, thank you. And that, you know, obtaining water in, in certain areas in Addis Ababa can be difficult. And he went on to describe to me that this was, uh, it was unfortunate that they hadn't been colonized 
because they would have better water systems and better sanitation systems if they had been colonized. This was absolutely terrifying and flabbergasting for me and obviously threw me off for the rest of the interview. Someone mentioned microaggressions in the chat. That was an absolute macroaggression. Yes, absolutely. I mean, as someone who has a history in my bloodline of colonization from a person that looks like this, the colonizer, you can imagine what was going through my mind uh, the rest of that interview. And this is what we face when we, when we have to deal with the dominant class who is the gateway for all of these positions with all of us have a right to obtain. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Ryan. Um, about a year ago, Kevin um, handed me over something that was like a webinar situation for with one of those organizations where they were supposed to be starting to address the DEIJ situation. So I took him up on it. He wasn't able to, to, to attend. I attended. Um, and, you know, interesting, it was very much like you say, the dominant there. I don't think they thought there was anybody there that was going to shake them up uh, because it was all pretty much looked to me like white privilege to be honest, um, you know, with it. And so, and they didn't really let anybody speak. Like they really weren't addressing anything that was DEIJ. They were like going around in circles with it. Finally, we got to, I got in about the last five minutes, got to, you know, dress. We did do some breakout room things. And so that was good. But then we, when we came back about the last five minutes, I got to ask, and I don't exactly remember what, what it was that I would dress, but I know I started it with, let's just, let's, the, the elephant in the room is this. And I said, you know, there wasn't really enough. And then they kind of very gingerly, yeah, yeah, you know, that we, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. But like, you know, I never thought really that they um, got it or that anything meaningful with most of those people on that webinar was going to occur. So it was very, and it was with one of those organizations you were talking about, very, very interesting to me and almost shocking that that's where they were. This was just a year ago. So I, you know, I can, as I can testify, they weren't very far. And I don't think they're probably very far in it. You know, my opinion would be even today. You know, so it is something that is uh, still very much a problem. And even last night, someone shared with me something that came out that I put on social media, because if it's shared publicly, then we can share it publicly. Um, that's very, it's, it's concerning, you know, about um, international schools and, and hiring practices. And it was very blunt in terms of geographically where you come from, you're preferred. And that spoke volumes and it had logos and everything on that. And um, we're addressing that today. So, because we don't wanna be affiliated with anyone that is perpetuating any of these systems. And it just, that's just is what it is. All right, now we have a few moments left. Um, I wanna just close and us. There, were, there were two questions that one came to me privately and one that's from Matthew. Um, and I wanted to chat about Matthew's question first because Matthew, you raised really the crux of the work moving forward um, and, and the word colonial base in equity, thinking about Ryan's story, which is, just take a moment to process that for a moment. But like, um, I think um, that's that's the next phase of the work. I don't have an answer that is going to uh, satisfy either myself or anyone, but really just wanted to share with you that it's something we're aware of. It's something we need to unpack. Um, we have invited uh, uh, at times, um, not as much as we'd like, our local staff to be part of our DEI uh, training. Uh, we want to be sure that we're all centered in this work together, that it's not coming from the expat sort of staff from a top down, but it's part of a, a really kind of like uh, distributed uh, sort of all in um, model of uh, change management as a school. Um, I think that that's one step. Um, I think the other part that we really kind of wanted to think about was um, an audit uh, and the stories that come out of that audit. So one of the strategic the sort of pillars of our strategic directions 
is to engage in a full school DEIJ audit. Uh, uh, we've, we've got someone on board to support us in that work. Um, and part of that work is then actually to go in and really dig into those stories. Um, because to re like, I think we, we kind of hit a point and I'm speaking sort of both about recruitment, but even stepping out more broadly into DEIJ work is that we, we've kind of hit a point where now we are, we're open, where we're not online and, we, and we're in a position to bring really kind of third party facilitators to help us bring that work forward. Um, and so we, um, we are engaging with a, a, a colleague who will help us in that space. So uh, Matthew, I don't have the right answer. I don't have an answer that will satisfy really anyone in the room other than to say it's something that we know is part of the next phase of our DEI work and is baked into our strategic uh, into our strategic directions and our annual action plan. Uh, so that's question uh, one. I hope Matthew that sort of maybe answers it a little bit. Uh, and then the second question was actually sort of the mirror of ad admissions and uh, recruitment. Um, at an inter at our school, we have nationality caps. We have sort of like a, a placement on how much representation we can have from any one, any one group. And that sort of helps us keep our representation pretty broad as an international school. And, and, and Maggie, we can chat more later about what that looks like. So when you have a chance, we can jump on a call together later. So awesome. I think that's, yeah. And Brian added a resource in there and we're adding in our link tree from ALOC with upcoming events. We're adding in tonight's article. If you've not read that, highly recommend it as well as what we have been working on. Um, and a lot of this priority wise, our priority for us starts with um, ALOC schools. First, we have some schools on here, Dakar's on here, Qatar's on here. Um, so we, again, are crafting a space where priority goes to ALOC member schools. So if they wanna post any of their leadership positions, DEIJ positions, um, consultancy needs, they'll be able to go here. And then any other school that might not be an ALOC school, um, they would have to connect with Ann and myself to ensure that, because we'll have a process. So it won't just be anyone can post here. Um, so we're not focused on teacher recruitment. Ours is more on leadership, consultancy, and DEIJ leaders. So it's been a big ask for folks um, over the last few years from us. And so folks will be able to um, post here, but it, there will be a process. So, but ALOC member schools will have priority first and then any other schools who aren't ALOC member schools um, can reach out to us for more information on that. So as we close, I wanna say thank you all again so much for attending. Thank you Tanai. Um, if there's any questions, we got one minute left. Anything else you wanna add? Um, again, thank you for joining us in this space. Good to see everyone. Um, and we, may we continue to dismantle, disrupt, um, reimagine and build practices that are truly centered around humanity um, and ensuring that folks are seen, heard, and valued and affirmed throughout. Uh, we are so excited for this being the first session. Thank you for kicking us off tonight. There are many more coming, y'all, so be prepared. And we are definitely tackling those issues that may not be talked about in the recruitment world. And if there's any topics that you're interested in, things are, that you want to hear and see more about, please reach out to us and let us know.